can't beat the old rugged cross, can you? Amen. That's pretty. Amen, amen. Good to be here, folks. Man, what a good warm place to meet. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell you, this meeting they just had in Copenhagen about the world, having a world summit about the global warming, this weather doesn't fit their agenda, does it? Father, we pray, Lord, you give me wisdom this morning, a gift of teaching. Then, our Father, we pray you'd open the hearts of the folks to believe and receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you turn the gospel, not gospel, but the epistle to 1 John, chapter number 1, 1 John. Now, as you know, the apostle John, one of the uh, inward circle, Peter, James, and John, one of the three, He wrote five books in the Bible. He wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He wrote the book of Revelation. And he wrote the Gospel of John. And uh, the, uh, there's a consistency about his writing that I wanted to call your attention to this morning, show you some things in here about the... Uh, on the surface of it, you have to be careful dealing with what John says because he gets into some great depth in dealing with some profound issues. In, uh, if you'll notice over here in the book of 1 John, chapter number 3, verse 9, notice what John says. Whosoever is born of God, you notice the terminology, born of God. All right, that's a direct reference to the new birth. The Apostle John's the one who said in John, uh, quoting the Lord Jesus, of course, in, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter number 3, where you must be born again. So he's, uh, he continues on with that uh, idea of the new birth. But now here he approaches it from a different manner. And we'll deal with that in just a moment. But if you'll notice in chapter number 1 of the book of First John, he deals with the issue of sin and the individual walk of the believer with God. And starts in verse number 1 of John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, in the same manner that he does in the Gospel of John, chapter number 1. For here he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 1, in verse 1, he said, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And uh, referring, therefore, to the word of God. He gives great credence to the Word of God. The Word of God is not the Word of a man. The Word of a man is coming from a creature. The Word of God is being spoken by the Creator. There is power in His Word. And if you notice, he says in verse 2, the life was manifested and we've seen it and bear witness, show you that, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Eternal life did not originate on this earth. It came from glory. He came from glory because He is eternal life. And therefore, eternity must come from outside what you live in. Because the sphere that you live in is temporal. And an eternal one had to come into this temporal existence. And so the scripture says, That which we've seen, have declared and heard, declare we unto you. What he's trying to say to you is that I am an, I, I am an eyewitness. I was there. I knew him. I even touched him. So therefore, if you want to dispute my word, go right ahead and call me a liar if you please. But the facts will bear me out. I was there. And he said, we've seen and heard and declare we to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated fellowship is koinonia. And that simply means that two folks have the same thing in common. And these things write we to you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we've heard of him and declare to you that God is light. Now the word of God is God, God, but notice that he is light. And in scripture a number of words are used to describe not an attribute of God, but his essence and nature. There's a difference between an attribute and essence, you see. An attribute is something that is about you, that you do, that characterizes you. The essence has to do with what you are. 
And the Word of God says God is love. The Word of God says God is a consuming fire. The Word of God says God is light. And the Word of God says God is the Word. All right, now this is what the Scripture says is His essence. So when you deal with an issue like that, you're dealing with a manifestation of who He is. Not, I'm glad to know what He does, but it's good to know who He is. And light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we do not the truth. So what does it mean to walk in darkness? It means to walk in rebellion. It means to walk outside the light. It means to say that you are saved and that you're walking in fellowship with God and living an ungodly life. Don't work. It won't work. That's, that is an absolute uh, incompatibility. Won't work. Won't work. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us, us from all sin. Notice the cleansing. Notice the present tense of cleansing. Notice the present tense of sin. Notice that sin is with the believer. Notice this is a believer we're talking about. We're not talking about an unbeliever. Now, hold your place here and go to 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now go to chapter number 2 and verse number 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now you've got three separate approaches right there to the same issue. Three. You've got three separate approaches to the same issue. One approach is that you're walking in fellowship, and as you're walking in fellowship and walking in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansing, is cleansing, present tense, continually cleansing you from all sin. The other approach from is says that if you are born of God, you do not commit sin. Then the other approach is conditional and says that if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. To say, therefore, an advocate with the Father is to elevate it above the earth and to take it into a place where there's something going on that's judicial, that has to do with God's relationship with you. Now, God's a holy God, holy, holy, holy. And the Bible says His eyes are too pure to even look upon sin. So, therefore, the relationship you have with God is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. For He is the mediator of sin. Because He's the mediator of the New Covenant. And the Bible says, one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. What is a mediator? A mediator is one who mediates, goes between. He's an arbiter. He's an advocate. He's one who takes a position in the middle that deals with both sides of the issue. If you call upon a federal arbiter to come in and deal with a dispute between a union uh, striking a company... An arbiter comes in, supposed to usually a federal arbiter. In other words, an, an official from the federal government will come in with his team. He'll sit down at a table. He'll put the union on one side. He'll put the company on the other side. And he'll try to work out the problem. And the point is that he is a, a go-between. He's one who goes between two opposing forces. So who would Christ be going between? And who's the opposing force? You'll notice how Satan works in the area of sin. It's about sin. Satan's power is in sin because he wields the power of death. And the Bible says when the Lord came, the Lord Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he came to break the power or destroy the power of the enemy. You, you remember it saying that? Well, why does he need to destroy the power of the enemy? Because death is like a cancer. If not, I mean, sin is like a cancer. If nothing stops it, it will ultimately lead to death. That's where it's headed. That's what's going to happen. That's, going to, that's its nature, that's its essence, and that's what's going to be produced from it. The only thing that can be produced from sin is death. All right, so the Apostle John deals with it, and he deals with it from, from what I've given you here are three separate ways. Way number one is the fellowship of the believer with the Father and the Son. And this fellowship is so important. Notice that he starts the whole book with fellowship. He starts it with communion. He starts it with two people having the same in common. That's what communion and fellowship is about. It's about the common, when we hold things in common. You remember the Bible said 120 in the upper room, the Scripture says that they had all things, what? 
in common. They met for the purpose of calling the power of God down from heaven and God fulfilling His promise. So when you have in common what the mind of Christ is and the mind of the Father, you can walk in fellowship even though sin is still present. For the Bible says if we have fellowship with the Father, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, is cleansing, continually cleansing us from all sin. But then you have to deal with what he said in 1 John 3 when he said, He that is born of God doth not commit sin. You see the approach John's taken? He's looking at sin from different aspects. He's, he's approaching it from different directions. Now, what, when you do something like that, you approach something from different directions, it gives you a much broader spectrum, a, a much broader idea of what you're dealing with. And, uh, to, and, and when you do that, then you understand the nature of your enemy. In the Bible, in the New Testament, sin is not so much presented as a thing as it is an essence. And it is in an essence in the sense that it has a personality about it and it has an intelligence about it. And the Bible says over there in the book of, uh, in the book of James, it says when sin, when it is finished, see, finished. Well, now you don't, you don't give that, that, that thought and that idea is that, that there must be something going on in the power of sin that it's more than just what you're doing. That it's got to be something greater than that. And it is. It is. Because the book of 1 John is written to deal with the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is. And the book of 1 John introduces to you the term Antichrist. Now an Antichrist is one who is against Christ. He's against Him. He's against Christ. But he's also set over in contradistinction to. In other words, to compare the two. This is what John's dealing with. Compare them. He starts out by telling you, I know Christ. I was with Him. I saw Him. I even handled Him. So I know the one I'm talking about. And now he says, here's how you can tell an anti-Christ. You don't have to say, it's not an issue of what he looks like. It's really, uh, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with what church he belongs to. You say, well then how can you tell an anti-Christ? You can tell an anti-Christ by his spirit. And the spirit will manifest itself in what it says. And the Apostle John deals with that later on. Now say, why is it so important to deal with the Lord Jesus Christ as it relates to sin because he's the remedy for sin there is no other remedy there is no other there is no other remedy it's not penance and it's not pay, praying to the saints and it's not good works and it's not anything that man has devised and concocted and fabricated and contrived down through the years the issue is Christ and sin and Christ is the only remedy for sin so what Antichrist does, what is he going to do? He's going to assault the remedy. He's going to attack the remedy. He's going to attack the very foundation and fabric of what you are. If he can get your eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ, sin will reign and have dominion over you. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can break that power. So when he starts out, he says you have fellowship with the Father. Well, do you have fellowship with the Father? Do you have communion with him? Do you have in common? In other words, is your life, mind, heart, soul, being about God and about Christ and about heaven and about His work and His Word and His Spirit and what matters to God? Or is your life li about the earth and the temporal things, the things that are going to burn, they're going to melt, they're going to, they're going to literally be annihilated? Is your whole life tied up in the here and the now or do you have anything in you that's eternal? Because to profess in your head with a bunch of facts that you believe, and, the, and fundamentalist Baptists are awful bad for this because we are the bastions of orthodoxy. We're the, we're the, we're the seat of the faith. We're the ones who, we have, we have the doctrines. We've got them right. I mean, we do, we've got them. And, uh, and as long as we espouse these doctrines and preach them, why, everything must be okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because you're not walking in fellowship. So he starts off the whole book by saying this right off the bat. I mean, he gives you something here that immediately is going to separate the believer from the unbeliever. He doesn't get into some long theological discourse. He just simply approaches it and says, if you're living in sin and walking in sin and walking in darkness, you don't know him. You don't know him. You don't know him. And then later on, he deals with individual sin. But notice here, it's not individual sin he's dealing with. What he's dealing with here has to do with communion with the Father. And it's a wondrous thing. I, I was in the church a long time. I really was a long time before I really understood the issue 
that uh, the Christian life is about. The Christian life is, about, is not about what you can do here. The Christian life is who Christ is to you. Once Christ becomes what he ought to be to you, you'll be doing what you ought to be doing here. It's like the man that's got the, the cart in front of him and he's trying to push it instead of pull it. He's got his donkey pushing his cart instead of pulling it. He's got everything reversed. And so 1 John deals with the issue of, of and notice carefully, it's very important to get this point. I want to, I want to belabor the point. He said, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. Okay? Now, does that tell you, therefore, that even though you're walking in communion and fellowship, sin is still present? Absolutely. Does that agree with what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter number 7 when he said, Though I would do good, evil is with me always. All right. So John lets you know right from the start that there is no such thing as sinless perfection in the flesh in this world. Get that right, okay? But you've got to get the, point, you gotta get, you get the perspective right. If you get the perspective right, the rest of it will come together correctly. So there is no such thing as sinless perfection. But now the Apostle John is not going to make a slight of sin because he's going to deal with it. <laughs> I mean, he deals with it. He takes a surgeon's knife to it. And he shows you how he deals with it. You know, it's not the thing to joke, make light of and joke about and so forth. Uh, he deals with the issue. But he wants you to understand that you can still have fellowship with the Father and with the Son and sin be there. But there's a difference in what you, how you look at it and what it's doing and what it is as it relates to the believer. Before the, for the Bible says plainly, sin dwells in my members. So how do you know that? Death is in my members. And death cannot come except from sin. Sin gives birth to death. Which, which came first, first then? Death or sin? Sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I've had quite a striking thing. I really have. Quite a remarkable thing. In all the years I've been in the ministry, I've never really had it so clearly laid before my eyes. When God made Adam... And he created that body. He made a body of the earth. And the body lay there. God put into that body his life. All right. Not God's life, eternal life, but he put the life, life into that body. The body came alive. When you die, you go right back where Adam was. The life leaves that body. And there it is. In plain words... If you want the physical without God, you've got it. Dead. If you want God to enter in, life. With the presence of God, there's life. The absence of God, death. And you can't have it both ways. Now look at 1 John chapter number 2, verse 1. Notice who's, who he's addressing, my little children. All right, he's not talking to unbelievers. He's not talking to hypocrites. He's not talking about you generation of vipers and so forth as the Lord addressed them. He said, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. See his attitude toward it? All right. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. All right. Now let's look at what makes you what you are. A body. All right. A body. Soul, spirit. God didn't make the soul. God breathed spirit life into Adam's nostrils, the body. His essence became a soul. All right? He had a soul. The soul is the intermediary between the spirit and the body. The spirit cannot communicate to the body because the body cannot receive from the spirit. The Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, foolishness to him, neither can he know them. It is impossible for the natural body to receive communication from the Spirit of God. Therefore, the soul of man came into existence. The soul of man is the intellect, emotion, and will where God had breathed life into him. Man, defined by his soul, came into existence. That's the Old Testament person. That's what he is in the Old Testament. That's what he is. When you're born again, 
you have literally now been born of God. You're born of God. Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus didn't have a clue what he was talking about, neither did the rest of them. And so he had to teach them what that meant. He even told his disciples before he left here, he said, I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them yet. You can't bear them. He said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. I think one of the great things he meant by that was the fact that I am going to raise up the apostle Paul and he's going to write the heart of the New Testament and he's going to spell out for you what the new birth is all about. The apostle Paul did it too. So here we have in the Old Testament a living body, a living soul, and a spirit. All right? But the spirit of the man in the Old Testament is not born again. Therefore, he does not have that connection and communion with God like a New Testament believer does. Why? Because the New Testament believer's very life, the new birth that God gives you, is the life of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, the second man, the last Adam. Now we introduce a situation where we can get complicated because you have been born again. That which is born of God cannot sin, he said in 1 John 3. He cannot sin because his seed remaineth in him. What seed? The seed of Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman. The seed was implanted by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the very, God, by the very life of God that's been put into you. That's the life of God. That is impossible. It would be just as impossible for God to sin as it would be for the born-again nature of a believer to sin. But here's the problem. You have now a soul that is in a situation that it never had been in the Old Testament. Because now the soul of a man, intellect, emotion, and will, can on one hand reach up and take hold of the very life of God, but on the other hand, being the intermediary between God and the body, that soul can also reach down and begin to grovel in the elements of the earth. Therefore, a decision must be made by the soul. A choice must be made, a, 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 a choosing, you see. This is why he gives you a conditional statement in 1 John. He said, my little children, these things are right unto you that ye sin not. He's He's laying before them the possibility that you make a choice one way or the other. There is no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. Condition, a choice. What's going on then? It is the soul of the born-again believer that lies in the balance, not the spirit. Spirit's untouchable. Spirit cannot be touched. The Spirit's the life of God. You've been born of God. This is why he said, He that is born of God doth not sin. Cannot sin. Impossible to sin. So what John's dealing with in here then is the fellowship of the believer living the life of faith that can give him victory in this world and that if he doesn't do that, he can wind up sinning a sin that literally leads him to death. For in 1 John chapter number 5, he said, If you see a brother sinning a sin unto death, don't pray for him. See? He's bringing you through all of, the, all, of the, all of the aspects of it up until the point to where that soul is making a decision, making a choice, either to receive strength from above, from the Spirit of God, and walk in communion and fellowship, and thereby getting victory over sin and walking in light, and even though sin dogs him and trails him and tries his best to tear him down, he walks in communion and fellowship. And by walking in that, the blood of Christ is cleansing his conscience. The conscience is, the conscience is, is that part of the soul of the man that is the higher part of him. And it's the, it, it, it's, it directly affects his will, his volition. Intellect, emotion, and will. The conscience and the will are, are all practically synonymous. 
And if he's walking in light, he's walking in communion, walking in fellowship, the power of sin to kill and destroy and drag him down and ruin him and ruin his life is nullified. For the blood of Christ is cleansing his conscience, renewing his mind. He's walking in fellowship. He's walking with the Lord. And this is what the apostle deals with when he, when he says that if you are born of God, you do not commit sin. The word commit there literally means to practice some kind of life-killing sin. And this is what happens to Christians. Your mind is the playground, the battleground. The mind is that part of you where you make your decisions. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. The mind is not the spirit. A spirit being is, listen, you, how many times have I said, nobody knows the essence of a spirit? Nobody does. This is why when God says God is light, okay, what is that? What kind of light is that? That's not that light. The Bible said God is love. What kind of love is that? That's the pure love of God. God is, God is a consuming fire. The scriptural statements about the essence of God, we can only understand them as we observe the physical creation. But I'm certain that when it's talking about these things, it's a much higher order than anything we understand on this earth. So when we come down to the mind of Christ, let this mind be in you, Philippians 2, which was in Christ Jesus. He's talking about a manner of thinking received through the Spirit. Receive the strength you need into your thinking processes to understand that you're no longer of this earth and this earth no longer has power over you and you're no longer a servant of sin. But that's not the spirit dealing with that. That's the soul dealing with that. The battleground of the believer is in the soul. Now, let's say, let's say you get real soulish. What's that mean? Well, that means that you think your whole life is about your intellect, emotion, and will. You get real soulish, not very spiritual. Because you take anyone who is really spiritual, it'll humble them. And they won't be real soulish. But you take someone who wants to constantly manifest how smart he is and show you his achievements and, and the greatness of him and this and so forth. You're and he may even be born again, but he's soulish. Intellect, emotion, and will. See, he's, he's projecting his intellect onto you. He, all he, uh, you, get the, you get some people who all they want to do is deal with your emotions. They want to get you to cry, get you to move, spirit, you know, sad stories and stuff. That's the area of the soul. So if you, are you how many following me here this morning? You're dealing in the, in the area of the soul. That's where the devil can really work with you too. Okay? And if you understand that if you start becoming real soulish, then you're, you're going to become fleshly. Because you're going to receive your stimulus from the flesh. You're going to start to receive from this earth things that do move you emotionally. And there is a natural inclination in anybody to want to be respected and lifted up and exalted and talked about and bragged on. Because that's all the world lives for. That's what they're all about. So you can, you can understand by the way you're feeling this morning and the way you think this morning where you've been receiving your stimulus from. If, you're, if, you're, if it's all about emotion and about pumping yourself up and about feeling good, you're getting it from the world. But if you've come in here today and you love Jesus and you want to exalt Him and lift His name up and glorify God and eternal things wrap your soul up, you think about that which is holy and spiritual and eternal and your mind is beginning to soar into the heavens, you're starting to get something from God. But the soul, once again, is the battleground. And the Apostle John deals with the soul. This is what he's dealing with. 1 John chapter number 2. Look carefully. My little children, these things write you if you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So who does, who, who's doing the sinning here? What's going on? Somebody answer me. What's doing? Who's doing the sinning in here right now? Exactly, but let's break it down. Can your spirit sin? No. Can your, is your body perfect? No. All right. The Bible has a statement in the Old Testament that says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. All right. And the Bible says that you can save a soul from death. Can the soul die? It can die in the sense that it has lost contact and fellowship with the Father. Yes. The soul can be, the soul can get into such a situation to where a born again saved believer can literally be beaten to death 
and grovel with the world. Can it happen? Yes, it can. So what's happened to that soul? Has that soul sinned? Yes. So what you're dealing with here in 1 John 5 is not the sinning of a spirit being impossible. And he's really not spending a lot of time with the flesh because the, they all, we all understand the flesh. The flesh is the flesh. That's all. The best thing to do for the flesh is keep it clean, feed it, rest it, and mortify its members. You notice how I refer to it as an it? Because it's not me. <laughs> I just happen to be in it right now using it. It got me in here this morning. I could have gotten here without it, though. <laughs> because once you're out of this body, believe me, he has a home for you in heaven that is eternal, made not with hands. So it's a vehicle that I use that I'm temporarily residing in. It's a tent. And one day we'll strike the tent and we'll be gone. Right. Amen. You know, so you can invest everything you've got in your body or you can spend some time with your spirit. Either one of the two. So what is John dealing with? He's dealing with the soul. Okay. Now see, we spent all that time coming up to that point. The Apostle John is dealing with the soul of the believer. And that's important. Because remember, I told you, that's where the battle is fought. This is why the Bible is constantly urging you to renew your mind, renew your mind, renew your mind. Walk in fellowship, walk in communion. And it tells you whether you're walking in communion or not walking in communion. Renew your mind, renew your mind, renew your mind. Now God knows that. First John chapter number 2, he said, if a man sin, we have a what with the Father? We have an advocate. Okay. What's an advocate? What does that term mean? Well, he, he, a mediator is, is... An advocate doesn't necessarily have to be a go-between. A mediator is a go-between. What's an advocate? Well, lawyers. Some of them are advocates and some of them aren't worth a... <laughs> There's some good lawyers and bad lawyers. <laughs> I know some good ones and I know some bad ones. But what, but what, what, is, what is an advocate? Uh, what does the word mean? When I say, let's say, for example, I'm going to advocate, uh, I'm going to advocate widening Broadway. I'm for it, exactly. See what the word means? An advocate is one who is for, to advocate. You see, the word can be used either, either as a noun or a verb. And it means, therefore, one who is for. All right. Therefore, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He is for us. The Bible said, if God be for us, who can be against us? All right, see there? Now, what's, ha what's happened here then? Well, the Scripture says in the book of Revelation, chapter number 12, that the accuser of the brethren is cast down. Now, would he be for you or against you? Yeah, an adversary and an advocate would be the definite would be would be the two opposing terms. An advocate is for you, an adversary is against you. And the meaning of the term Satan, that's what it means. Adversary. So therefore, if he's accusing you, he's a what? He's an adversary. So therefore you have an advocate and an adversary. Remember now what we're dealing with. Are we talking about the spirit? Do you realize, folks? And I didn't, uh, I, this didn't settle into my soul until a few years ago. You can go to places the devil can't go to. You realize that? Do you know that? Do you realize that you have a new and a living way where you can approach the Father in the Beloved? That you can go into the very presence of Almighty God in such a holy place that Satan wouldn't dare enter in. He can only go so far with you. Only go so far. And that's a wonderful thing to know, because if you really get into uh, if you get into what this advocacy is talking about here, and what it's talking about for someone, an intercessor is an advocate. If you're interceding for someone, you're an advocate because you're pre you're presenting them before the Lord, you're carrying them before God. Then you've got a marvelous understanding of what's going on. If you walk in the light as He is in the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, is cleansing, constantly cleansing you from all sin. John says, if you have sinned, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So it looks to me like, from reading the Bible, that everything that is necessary for your victory and for you to walk in fellowship and for you to have what you need is given to you. It's there. It's, it's present. Now understand this. This is nothing you can see. If you're a fleshly Christian, carnal Christian, 
and it, the terms are almost uh, uh, incongruous, you know, a, a, a fleshly Christian, <laughs> but it's true. It can be. A carnal Christian, a carnal Christian is a fleshly Christian. Card word carne is a Latin word for a flesh. Chili con carne is chili with flesh. All right? So a carnal Christian is a fleshly Christian. What would a fleshly Christian be? Tell me, what, what would you think a fleshly Christian would be? Carnal Christian. He's living by the, he's living by the standards of the world. He thinks like the world. All right? He lives. He lives his life. If that thing starts to smoke, I'll hit the switch right over here and we'll kill the power to it. <laughs> All right. These lights uh, on occasion do that. The Bible said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I've often wondered if the devil's not in electricity sometimes. <laughs> but in any, <laughs> any event, I saw a bunch of people look at that thing and it popped and went out. The uh, advocacy. All right. He's an advocate. He's for us. And so he starts out First John by telling you all that God is going to do for you. Okay? Now look what happens as he moves through the book. See how much time we've got? We've got about seven minutes here. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. All right. Now, look carefully. First John 4, 1. Beloved... Believe not every spirit. All right, now watch carefully now. Watch his wording. But try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets enter in the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, is that important? All right, now, let's jump ahead for just a moment. And here's what he's saying. Let's let John define himself, 1 John 5. Before we say we understand what John meant when he said, if a spirit confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, let John define himself. 1 John 5, verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come. All right, that's what he just said. Spirit confessed Jesus has come in the flesh. Now, you'd say, now, I don't want to... Just listen to me just a moment. There's an awful lot of people that believe Jesus Christ came into this world. Okay? The fact is most, uh, most people believe that he came into the world. All right? But John's dealing with a specific issue of Jesus Christ. There's something he wants you to know that separates the one from the believer from the Antichrist. And here's what it is. We know that the Son of God has come, hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. Now watch this. This is what? Who is? Jesus Christ. All right. So what did he say? He said that if a spirit denies that God has come in the flesh. Did I change anything? No. No. Because as far as the mind of, of John is concerned, Jesus Christ is God. Therefore, I don't care who you are, if you deny that God has come in the flesh, and there's only one God, we're talking about a Jew here 2,000 years ago, hear your Israel, the Lord your God is one God, one Lord. And so he is saying that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true God, and John also wrote Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 8, in Revelation 1.8, if you look in your Bible and read it, it says this, I am the Almighty. He uses the term El Shaddai. The Apostle John said that Jesus Christ is the Almighty. The Apostle John said in John chapter number 1, the Word was with God and the Word was God. And in 1 John chapter number 5, the Apostle John says that this is the true God and eternal life, Jesus Christ. So how do you know an Antichrist? An Antichrist denies that God has come in the flesh. It's that simple. So how do you know you've got an Antichrist Bible? I just had to do that. I'm sorry. You know how it is. <laughs> Turn to 1 Timothy 3.16. <laughs> I just had to do that. 1 Timothy 3.16. I 
Let me see what kind of Bible I've got. Let's just check our Bible out here with John, okay? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Does your Bible say that? You've got a good Bible. Say, my Bible doesn't say that. It says he who was manifest in the flesh. Well, then use it as a paperweight or as a, uh, you know, you can use it a bookend or something like that. Don't give it to anybody. You don't do that. And get yourself a Bible. So how do I find it? It's got KJV 1611 stamped on it. That's the authorized version. That's God's Word. You know why you get real? Some folks are more fanatical than I am about this. They really are. But do you know why folks get upset about stuff like this? Is because I just showed you what the Apostle John said. He said, The spirit of Antichrist is any spirit that denies that God has come in the flesh. Well, if you've got a Bible that denies that God has come in the flesh, you've got an Antichrist Bible. Well, if you've got an Antichrist Bible, what kind of spirit do you think it's going to produce? And if you've got an Antichrist Bible producing an Antichrist spirit, what kind of church do you think you're going to have? And by the way, what's the point in it to begin with? You say, well, I can't understand the King James Bible. Why well, don't you pray about it? Why don't you pray about it? Why don't you pray about it? Hey, how many of you can understand politicians when they talk? Raise your hand. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I guarantee if you talk about double speak and triple speak, you listen to a politician, you're liable to hear anything. So it brings us to that. Well, I'll have to close with this this morning. First John 5, as I'm, I've already quoted it to you, but, uh, you know, it's good to read it because you, you can see it. Uh, and, and, and what you see visually makes an impression on your mind. Uh, in First John chapter number 5, the uh, verse 16, if any man see... His brother, now we're talking about a born-again believer. Yes, we are. Sin, a sin, which is unto death. He shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. What did he just say to you? He said, God will let you intercede for a brother that's backslidden, cold on God, out in the world. He'll let you intercede for him. But if you try to intercede for him and God won't let you intercede for him, then maybe God shut the door on him and he's about ready to take him out of here. Because he's crossed the point. He's crossed the line. And that uh, his soul, the soul is already dying in this world. And the flesh is dead anyway. The Bible said the only reason the flesh is alive is because the Spirit of God's in the flesh to keep it alive. The Bible says the flesh is dead for, because of sin. That's what it says. The only reason your flesh is moving around right now is because the Holy Ghost is in your flesh. Not you, the Holy Ghost. The reason the unsaved man's flesh is walking around is because he's in it. The only reason my flesh is walking around is because the Holy Ghost is in it. And the Holy Ghost leaves, my flesh drops dead at that very moment. It's finished. So my soul either lives or dies in this world. And for the soul, he wants your soul to live. He wants you to live. He wants you to walk in fellowship and communion. And if you do that, he'll, bl he'll bless you. And the blood of Christ will cleanse you from all sin. If you don't, you can die. Die a premature death. And when you do, you're dead. But your spirit's gone on to God who gave it. Eternal life is eternal life. All right. Let's have prayer and we'll let you. Yes, sir. Amen, brother. No, they just assent to a bunch of facts. Intellectual assent. I agree with this, I agree with that, I agree with this, I agree with that. That makes me saved. No, no. The entrance of the life of God is what makes you born again. And when that happens, of course, that's a whole different message. You're going to change. Everything changes, your desires and all. All right, Brother Roger Lee dismisses.